Hello, Ruckus Makers. Today I am joined by Dr. Donna Marie Kozine, who helps overworked and exhausted educational leaders establish work life balance so they can lead their organizations and live the lives they deserve. She's a leader, author, speaker, podcast host, and executive coach. Dr. Kozine has been featured in Authority Magazine, Principal Magazine, The Rochester Beacon, Medium. Connections with Evan Dawson, WHAM 13, Rochester, New York, WXXI News, Rochester, New York, and various national and international podcasts. Dr. Kozine, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you, Danny. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy we are connected now. I've been seeing um, how you show up in the world in uh, a lot of your social posts and that kind of stuff. And I know that the message you have, the, the way you support school leaders is so important. And so it's my honor to have you here today. I'd, I'd love to start and uh, go back to 2012. And you have an idea to start a, a charter school in Rochester. But you told me that everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Oh, my gosh. And so tell us that story. Yeah, it's uh, Murphy's Law, I guess, but maybe you should call it Cosine's Law because uh, <laughs> I said to somebody yesterday there, by, by the three G's, it happened. Uh, God's grace and grit, <laughs> it happened. Yeah. So yeah. in 2012, um, I was at a crossroads in my career. Mm. I had been supporting some Rochester high schools as a member of the college board. We had a uh, model school. And in 2012, the superintendent at the time said, we're not going to do this anymore. So I said, well, what am I going to do? My children were three and 10 months old. And I decided, you know what, I want to start a charter school of the arts, because what I was mm. noticing in working with these high schools was kids were coming in at the seventh grade at a third grade reading level. Mm. And the teachers were killing themselves from seven to 12th grade to try and get these kids not only reading on level, but, you know, in New York, you have to pass the regents exams in order to graduate on time. So I had this great idea. Let me start this charter school for elementary children that services the city of Rochester. But also I could bring my own kids there. How hard could it be? Right. Hmm. So, you know, those are that should be on my tombstone. Donna Marie Cozine. How hard could it be? <laughs> you know, uh, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Um so we ran into a lot of issues um, as I was trying to launch the school. First, I applied to, in New York, there are two chartering agencies and I applied to mm -hmm. SUNY chartering agency and we got, as, we got pretty far. And then they said, no, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said to me, well, you could, you could apply to NYSID, but you only have six weeks. So I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to do this? Am I not going to do this? So I spent six weeks turning around a brand new application. And I had a co-founder at the time, um, two co-founders. One was my mother. She did like all the finance stuff for the application. And another okay. gentleman um, who got into a little disagreement with the board and he quit mid-July. And we were supposed to open with staff at the end of August. And we were going to just, the two of us really launch this school. And uh, he quit. And then he asked to come back and the board said no. <laughs> and we had a meeting and they asked me, uh, they really wanted me to hire somebody new. And we had a conversation about that. But before we could get too far into that conversation, um, a board member basically called me out in front of everybody and said, mm -hmm. I think we should ask for a planning year because we are not ready to launch this school. And I felt very strongly that it was now or never. Either yeah. we were going to launch then or it wasn't going to happen because we already had 194 students registered for school. We had 32 staff members signed on the dotted line that we were going to hire them. And so if we all of a sudden say we need a planning year, no one's going to come back to us next year. They're mm -hmm. going to say this is the school that, you know, sold us a dream that they, you know, that they couldn't fulfill. So this board member says to everybody, they want a planning year. And I'm sitting there and my reptilian brain, of course, is firing. Like, what yeah. am I going to say? And I was like, okay, DMC, don't be inappropriate. And I said to her, I said to everyone, excuse me, you know, with all due respect, I, I didn't just fall off a turnip truck. I've run schools before. I can do this. And besides, we've made a commitment. 
And uh, I remember their good friend of mine, he's now a very good friend of mine. He was a board member. He said, let me ask you something. What's more likely to get us sued? Asking for a planning year or continuing until we can't go on anymore? And I said, I, I think we have to continue. I think that if we ask for a planning year, we have lost all credibility with the community. Yeah. So we went and I started with staff on Monday, I think it was August 11th. And guess what? I had no building. Mm. I had kids coming in three weeks and I had no building. Right around the time that the co-founder quit, we also, you know, not too much drama, I guess. We also lost the lease on the building that we were going to lease. Wow. So now wow. I have 194 kids. I have 32 staff members. I've got no school. So I launched my summer onboarding at another school's in another school's basement. And they're like, DMC, when can we see the school? Yada, yada. And I am literally, literally lying between, you know, lying. Oh, well, you know, we hope to be in there next week. And so that Tuesday, the board, because we were, we were leasing a school from a, a, a school district that it was a um, surplus school. So literally that Tuesday night at 7.30, the board approved it. And it was like, oh. so then I get Monday, I say to my husband, uh, Tuesday night, he's a painting contractor. Right. He clears his schedule. He gets all of his guys to get to the school, gets to the school. They won't let him in. So he calls me and he's like, they won't let us in. We're just going to go to the other job. I was like, okay. My phone rings 30 minutes later. He says, I just got into an accident and I totaled my van. Oh my so here I am in the middle of onboarding staff. Fortunately, I had them in small groups. And I said to everyone, just continue. I'll be back. And I went and rescued my husband. And it was just like one thing after another. But I wouldn't give up, Danny. Like I just knew that if I gave up, so many children and so many families would be just left behind. Because mm -hmm. at that time... You know, think about it. If you're in a charter school or you sign up for a charter school, you've missed enrolling in all the schools in the city or in your district. So what seats are left? The seats that are left are in the schools that nobody wants. And why don't right. they want those? Because they're underperforming, they're, you know, all of they're dangerous and all of those things. So every every time I came up upon this this obstacle, I was like, this is not going to sink this organization. I know that this organization is meant to be, and it is going to serve so many children. And it still is, you know, eight years later, um, you know, we're there in its eighth year. I recently did leave because my daughter was leaving. She started when she was four and she went through all the way through sixth grade. And we decided as a family, you know, it's a good time to uh, be available to her because you were not a middle school girl, but I was a middle school girl. And I knew that my daughter as a middle school girl was going to need her mama a little bit more. So that's when I launched and I changed things and wrote my two books and uh, I'm working with schools and districts across the country. So that's my story. And, you know, I, I, I just feel so much like a ruckus maker. You know, you talk about ruckus makers and, you know, um, Susan B. Anthony, I believe it was Susan B. Anthony who said uh, well-behaved, something around about well-behaved women seldom make history, you know? Mm. And I think it's, that's true, right? You have to be that ruckus maker who makes things happen. Um, so I'm blessed that so many people believed in me um, and believed in that school. It is now on its third charter. We were uh, renewed twice and they're on the third charter. So it's all good, all good news. Yeah, what a story. Thank you, DMC, for, for sharing that. My, my follow-up question, I, I want to know like how you learned. I don't know if, you, if, if there was a moment or if it was a, a series of experiences and stuff, but you talked about reptilian brain and, and there's multiple events, right? You're there with the board or husband, you know, totaling the car, like not having a building, like there's so much going on where it'd be very easy just to walk away. You know what I mean? Right. But you said, I can't, we, we, we made this promise to the community, teachers are on board, you know, and you had this big vision, but what is it about you that, that you embrace that, right? Because the tension and the pressure can be so much, but here you are standing strong. You know, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I was raised by amazing parents and yeah. uh, my father 
became profoundly deaf when he was 11. He lost his hearing to spinal meningitis. Mm -hmm. And I think I was just raised in an, in an environment where you just don't give up. Like people yeah. have it way worse than you. Like, what are you complaining about? You know, and even, you know, those times when we're leaders and we think to ourselves like that imposter syndrome, am I meant to be here or whatever? Like, I think growing up in the environment in which I grew up, two things happened. One was I realized like, I don't have it bad, right? No matter what happens, you know, my dad had it bad. You know, he first had polio and almost died. Then he had spinal meningitis and lost his right. hearing. Only person in his family, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's bad. That's like, what do I have to complain about? And then, you know, the other thing that I really believed was if not me, then who? Right. Mm -hmm. If I'm not the one to stand up for these families and provide this option, who is going to do it? And the truth is nobody. There are few people like me and like you, Danny, who are want to go out there and want to do these things. And finally, I just don't think failure is an option. And mm -hmm. it's funny because if I'm doing something for myself, I'm a lot less gritty. But when I know I'm doing it for somebody else, and I'm doing it for a community, and I've looked parents in the eye and have said, I'm doing this for you, I just wouldn't fail. Let me tell you, I was registering kids for school at Wegmans, which is a big um, yeah, yeah. grocery store up here, uh, McDonald's, I was going to people's homes. Literally, I started July 1 in the basement of my house with two secretaries. Like, I just felt like I made a commitment to these people, and who am I? I mean, I'm Ed and Barbara's daughter. And they taught me better than to give up. So I think that's what it was. It was just pure grit, honestly. Right, right. Yeah. And that strong, that strong upbringing, right? So kudos uh, to your parents. What a, what a story there. Um, this is sort of similar sort of question, but I, it's very clear that you see obstacles as opportunities, right? Yeah. And so um, actually, before I get there, you know, the one thing I want to highlight, because I think this is, this is a really important point, too, uh, you talked about if it was for you, you'd have less grit and perseverance, but if it's for others, then you, you push through. And I know they talk about like the, the no, number two, like one and two fears that people have dying and speaking on stage. And I think it's speaking before dying. Right. Um, but right. I think, I think when folks get caught up in that, whether it's speaking or whether it's getting a charter school off the ground or whatever the challenge is, we get in our heads and we're thinking about like, Oh, poor me and this kind of stuff. But that's, that's the wrong perspective. And as you pointed out, if you connect to who you're serving, that will pull you through. That pulls you through the hard, the hard points. So I just, I wanted to highlight for the ruckus maker listening. Uh, but can back I to, yeah, 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 of course you can. can. I ask for your ruckus makers? I think the other thing is ego. Yeah. yeah. And I totally didn't have one. I was mm. like, this school is not me. I mean, like, this is bigger than me. This is not about me. And if I get in my head and think, oh my goodness. And, uh, I'm Donna Marie Cozine and I, la, 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 you know, like leaders sometimes get in their ego and I just would not let my ego out, you know, yeah. like everyone has it right. Like I'm really proud of what I've accomplished, but I know that what I've accomplished will be there well beyond me. And that's mm -hmm. true leadership, right? Creating something that will be there after you've left. Absolutely. And I think that you have to, when I started the school, I said to everyone from eight to four, hang your ego at the door. And I truly believe that it's not yeah. about what's best for me. It's about what's best for the community. It's about what's best for the children, you know? So I think also, in addition to what you said, I think ego plays a pretty big part in that for some people. Sure. Sure. So we're talking about like, you know, connecting with that bigger vision, connecting with those, mm -hmm. those you serve to pull you through the hard times. It's very clear that you see, you know, obstacles as opportunities too. And is there anything else that we could add to this sort of discussion, right? For the ruckus maker listening to say, okay, you, you get obstacles and maybe that gut reaction's like, ah, you know, shoot, yeah. why me type of thing. But then you got to switch it. Do you have any other, you know, ideas or feedback for the listener, how to see obstacles? As I, absolutely, I absolutely do. And there are two things that my people that I work with who I led would call me out on. Like, this is so typical DMC. The one is <laughs> if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Mm, yep. I will ask anybody for anything. I will Me call too. up and say, I need an AED. What do you got? You know what I mean? Like, uh, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. And I have gotten so further, so much further and so many more things for my organization by not being afraid to ask because 
no one likes to hear no, but if you don't ask, that's what the answer is. But if you actually extend yourself and ask questions or ask for favors or ask for something for your school, usually you get it because people want to help schools. And then I learned another, um, I went to a workshop by Bill Daggett and um, it was many years ago and it wasn't Bill who, who told me this and I can't remember the guy's name, but he said, don't go for the best solution, go for the next best solution. So a lot of times when we sit around the table, we come up with our best ideas. And he said, go another step, go past that, go past the, you know, the knee jerk reaction of let's try this, because usually that's what everyone else has tried. But if you say, well, what else can we do? What's another thing we can do? Then you're pushing yourself out of that comfort zone. And usually you come up with a solution that better matches your problem because every problem is unique. And if you try to solve a unique problem with the same old solution, you're not going to get a different result. Right. Got it. Cool. Well, I am really enjoying our, our conversation here, DMC. Um, and I would love to continue it. So we will absolutely do that. But we're going to pause here just for a second to get in a few messages from our sponsors. Now, when we get back, I'd love to talk about this idea that you have. Your mess is your message, which I That's think right. is super important. So we'll, we'll be talking about that in just a second. Great. Thanks. Learn how to successfully navigate change, shape your school success, and lead your teams with Harvard Certificate in School Management and Leadership. Get world-class Harvard faculty research specifically adapted for pre-K through 12 schools, self-paced online PD that fits your schedule. You can apply now at betterleadersbetterschools.com slash Harvard. The BLBS podcast is also brought to you by TeachFX. Research shows that the more students speak in class, the more they learn and the better they perform. TeachFX has helped hundreds of schools increase their student engagement by visualizing for teachers what portions of class are teacher talk versus student talk. You get a 20% discount on TeachFX by using a special code just for Ruckus Maker Nation. That's at teachfx.com slash BLBS. And finally, today's show is proudly sponsored by Organize Binder, a program which gives students daily exposure to goal setting, reflective learning, time and task management, study strategies, organizational skills, and more. Organized Binder's color-coded system is implemented by the teacher through parallel process with students, helping them create a predictable and dependable classroom routine. You can learn more at organizedbinder.com. And we are back with an amazing ruckus maker, Dr. Donna Marie Kozine. And we've talked about launching a, uh, a charter school. Everything that went wrong could go wrong, but you did not give up, which was amazing. And I, and I previewed uh, the second half of our conversation, kicking that off with how your mess is your message. What a beautiful idea. So bring us there. T talk to us and unpack that. Yeah. So for sure, I'd like to say first that I didn't think of it. Someone said, you know, was saying, you know, our mess is our message. And it's mm. really, really true that, you know, sometimes we have to be very transparent in order to help people understand that you too can achieve what we achieved. But most recently, the my mess is my message is around how I'm helping teachers, um, I'm sorry, leaders, because in the midst of creating this school one day, and I was on my computer, you know, after school, working, 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 and my husband said, we didn't sign up for this. Mm -hmm. I was like, what are you talking about? We didn't sign up for a credit card. We didn't like what, what were you talking about? He was like, the kids and I didn't sign up for this. You know, you said yeah. you were going to start this school. You had a partner, he's gone, you know, and he went through the whole thing. And I, it was like a car screeching to a halt. And I was, listened and I was like, this man who literally is the wind beneath my wings and is supportive of everything is calling me out. And he yeah. should call me out because he's right. So, um, I started making changes and I said, I really have to figure this out because I don't want to lose my family. I, I, you know, I, I still want to be my partner and have my children and all that, but I still love this school. I mean, the school is like my dream come true. Right. So I started coming home and I didn't open my laptop and I would put the kids to bed and all that. And then I would get in bed with my laptop and then I would start working. And my husband said, he's a saint. He said, well, 
you're making some progress, <laughs> you know, um, but now you're not here for me. So I was like, okay. And in doing that and establishing those boundaries, because really, Danny, it's about boundaries, right? right. And as leaders, right. we have a hard time setting boundaries. We feel like we need to be accessible to everybody all the time. And that's just not true. It, it's just not healthy and it's not true. Yeah. But with establishing some boundaries, I was able to do that. And in learning what was working for me and working for other people that I have coached in the past, I created my first book, this one up here. Um, and I outline my leadership drivers for leadership development. And those are really how I cr was able to effectively lead my organization and also live the life I was meant to live and deserve and be with my family and be with my children. And, you know, if I didn't stop and I didn't reflect, my mess really could have been even more of a mess, but instead it has allowed me to help so many other people. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that and being vulnerable and authentic. It, it really helps, you know, and uh, these, these stories we hear, right. But you, it's almost like you have to experience it for yourself, you know, to take that, to take that step. Um, and one of the things your story illustrates too, and, and I'm happy to have you uh, riff on this some more, but it's not like this either, or like you can, you can have the family and lead effectively. Right. Um, and it's something that you need to address because like you said, you still wanted your partner, you still wanted your kids. And those things are at, at stake if people don't wake up, right, and establish those boundaries. So any, any other advice, you know, for the ruckus maker listening, uh, maybe they've had that moment, they've ignored it, maybe they haven't had the moment yet, but what, what could they do? I think for me, what it came down to was, is very simple. The people who deserved the best of me mm -hmm. were getting the rest of me. And when I got home, there wasn't much left. Yeah. So I really think what you have to do is you have to look at what are your priorities and what's important in your life? And what is your mission? And is that aligned with what you're currently doing and in the organization in which you're doing? And the, the beauty of my driver's method and in the book, it walks you through all of these things to help you by the end have clarity around what you want, how to get it um, and create this like, map for you, right? If yeah. this is what you want, backwards map, this is what you need to do. What I would say is it's not impossible. There are many of us who are doing it. And I know that there are days that you think, oh, I can't do this another day. Or, oh, I want to go to bed at six o'clock. Or, oh, I can't wait until the weekend. Or you wake up in the morning, you don't want to go to work. I know that because I was that person. And I don't want that for people anymore because it's not, like you said, Danny, it's not one or the other. You can have both. It's just a matter of knowing where to focus your energy, your priorities, how to develop other leaders within your organization, um, and not feeling like you have to do it all, all the time. Yeah. So you, you've referred to your books, you know, and uh, I think you give them away too, which is um, incredibly generous, like amazing, amazing. What a contribution. So I know some ruckus makers will want to connect with you and get their hands on, on your book, books, excuse me. Like how, how do they do that? Yeah. So I give away PDF downloads of my book for free. Um, the, this book, so you want to be a superintendent, become the leader you're meant to be is actually, um, it's about leadership in general. And that's at getdonnasbook.com. And my second book, which I love both of the books. This one is about how to have more joyful schools. Uh, and this outlines something called the school joy method, which I've had a lot of success with schools with. And this one is you go to joyfulteachers.com and I'll give you the links and you can put them in the um, information. But yeah, I give them away for free because I want people to just better their lives and better the lives of the people around them. And these are things that um, I've seen work, I've made work and can work for you too. Amazing. So generous. So I highly encourage uh, ruckus makers listening to for sure connect with DMC, go to those websites. We'll have them for you in the show notes and uh, get your hands on those books. So DMC, you yes. can put one message right on all school marquees around the world. What does your message say? Standardized assessments are a must. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I was about to, like, um, steam was coming out of my ears. You're thinking, who is, who is this person? And what did my she do? Face with got red. I know, I see that. Um, it would be, you are loved. 
Yeah. I truly believe that as educators, and, and this has come through transition. I'm 48 years old. I started teaching at 20. I've been in this business 28 years. This has been my own like growth and revolution to realize that everything we do in education should be stemmed in love. Yeah. And if children don't feel loved, valued, appreciated, if we don't develop relationships with them, we are not taking them anywhere. And I think so many times it's like the teachers are here and the kids are here and, and, you know, don't let them see you smile till Christmas. That was what someone told me when I started right, teaching. Right. But my billboard would be, you are so loved because when children walk into a school and they feel loved, they will do their very best. Absolutely. Which brings us to the last question. And you kind of have done this, but you know, this is a thought experiment, so you won't have limitations this time. Yeah. Uh, and I promise you'll have your building right out of the gate. Okay. So okay, you're good. building this, <laughs> you're building a school from the ground up. You're not limited by any resources. Your only limitations, your imagination. So DMC, how are you building this dream school? And what are your three guiding principles? I love that. I really do love that because I, I had an opportunity to build my dream school, but of course there were things that were, you know, necessary. And one of those, right. unfortunately, are the standardized assessments. I do believe in assessing students. Absolutely. But I think what I would do differently, the first thing is how we assess students. I think I would do more of an authentic project-based assessments with large, um, we used to do something in our school called um, cul culminating events. We would have thematic mm. units and do culminating events. I would, the first guiding principle would be, we assess students to find out where their gaps are, right? Assessment isn't about gotcha for students. It's not about, I taught it, you didn't get it. It's about, okay, I taught and I'm seeing these gaps and let's fill those gaps. So it's changing the culture of assessment. So it's not scary. It's just a data point right? It's just a data point and we need to move past that. The second one is joy. And that's why I founded the first school is we need yeah. joyful schools. We need schools where kids come in, people are smiling, people are hugging them. People are saying, we believe in you. It it's, looks joyful. It feels joyful. You know, like you see what Paul Clark um, has done at Paul Clark, Paul Clark, right? Academy. It's Paul. Ron Clark. Clark. Anyway. Is that what you oh, talking about? Guy down I know yeah, a guy yeah. named Paul Clark. That's why. Ron Clark Academy. Like you see that type of thing, which he's able to do because it's a private school and lots mm -hmm. of funders. So that's the type of school I would want to create. One that just joy abounds, which I actually did create. And it's still like that. And then the third thing is every decision, and this costs nothing. And this can be done by every single one of your ruckus makers right now. Every decision that is made in your organization is on what's best for children and what's developmentally appropriate. Because so many things we do in education, you know, um, assessing students. I was so angry last year when they made us assess our students in New York State. Well, I think it was all the states because it was from if you took federal money, you had to do this. Right. So our kids had been home for six months and then some of them were home, some of them were away. We had to drag them into school to take, what's the point of it? what was the point? The data wasn't even valid. I mean, we gave tests that we had given before. It was stupid. It just made me angry. And it's because the decision wasn't made on what's best for students. So those are my three. Assessment, so people understand why we assess and make it authentic and meaningful. The second is joyful, just create joyful schools. And the third one is every decision, regardless, top down, every decision should be based on what is best for children and what is developmentally appropriate. Yes. So we covered a lot of ground today, DMC, and of we everything did. we talked about, what's the one thing you want a ruckus maker to remember? I want ruckus makers to remember that you're an educator and what you do matters. But if you don't take care of yourself, you can't give to others. I use with my leaders a metaphor of a watering can. You have a watering can and you go around and you water all of the teachers and you water all of the students and you water all the families. And when it's time to water yourself and your other families so you can bloom in, in your family, there's no water left. Hmm. So what you have to do is figure out how you can do both. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's possible. People will say, oh, it's the job. Oh, work harder. Oh yeah, I only sleep three hours a day. Well, that's wrong. None of those things have to happen. It can be different and it has to be different because we can't leave, we can't lose good 
leaders from our schools and districts.